Well, hello, everybody. Here we are again for the next set of sessions. So, if you have not been paying attention or have followed the channel associated with this talk, I recommend that you do that. So you can find that through browsing the channels in the open chat, and that'll give an opportunity for you to ask questions following up or whatever is necessary. Looks like we have an echo. And let's see if we can figure out where that's come from. Let's try and start this again and see if that will help. Well, or we'll cut it short. I think probably, oh, okay. So the echo's isolated, that's good. Well, let's find out. Okay, so let me introduce Kevin Murphy. He's going to go through our next live talk, which is really exciting to me. Don't forget to follow that Slack channel so that you can ask questions in the follow-up, and we will go for them there. All right, without further ado, Kevin, it's all yours. There was a time not that long ago where people could safely gather in crowds and wait for that wonderful moment where the house lights would turn out, the fog machine would kick in, the stage lights would turn on, and the band would take the stage. Concerts are one of the many things that I'm missing about in 2020, but I figured, you know what? I've got a captive audience here. Let's have a show. And in fact, we're going to help stage an entire tour of concerts using Ruby's coverage module. As Adam mentioned, my name is Kevin Murphy. I'm a software developer at the NAR company. We're a software consultancy in Boston, Massachusetts, or more accurately these days in the couches, dining room tables, and makeshift offices in the greater Boston area. Coverage, you call the aptly named start method. And here we're going to explicitly ask it to start in lines mode. We'll have the band play the first 10 shows of the tour. And let's see what we get back. What we get out of coverage is a big old hash. And I've already uh, condensed the output here. But let's dig in even further in just one of the elements of this hash and explain what we get back for results. Each of the keys in this hash are names of files that are executed while coverage is running. The value of which is another hash, where the key is the name of the mode. Here we explicitly asked coverage to start in lines mode, so thankfully we got lines back. And then for a value here in our inner array, we have, in a, we have an array. And what that array represents is how many times each line in this file was executed while coverage was run. Order is important in this array. So this first item at index zero is how many times line one of this file was run. In fact, lines one through six were all run one time over the course of the first 10 shows. Line seven is a special case. Uh, the nil here doesn't mean that it wasn't executed. It'd be zero in that case. Uh, coverage is telling us there's something special about this line, and that's that it considers it irrelevant. So let's open up this string file and see what we're talking about. And, and line seven is an empty line. So if you were to look at the results of coverage and you saw a zero, you might take that to mean that there's a problem or at least something to investigate, right? Maybe you have some dead code you can remove, or maybe you have a bug in your code that you're not running certain lines that you should be. But really, this is just an empty line. And, and what does it mean to even run an empty line or a comment or an end statement? I don't know, and, and coverage doesn't take a position either. Instead, it provides uh, adds semantic meaning to nil to tell you, you don't have to worry about this line. So if we go back to our problem statement, we're trying to figure out how many guitar strings we broke. So we can figure out the number of times each line in this file was executed. And if we go back to our implementation, we'll consider a string broken when it reports itself as broken, and that's on line 54 of this file. Uh, but remember, arrays are zero indexed. So to get the 54th L line, we actually need to ask for index 53. 
And as a result of that, we get that we broke 16 strings over the course of the first 10 shows. And now if you believe in the statistical significance of that, we can then place an order for the rest of the tour and the band can confidently uh, play the rest of the shows knowing that they have the equipment that they need to be able to do so. We're next going to move in to one shot coverage. And for one shot, we're going to help the band prepare for one very specific show. They've been booked to play a festival, which is great news. They get introduced to a larger audience that they regularly don't play to. Uh, the money's pretty good, and they actually play a shorter set, so they make more money for less work. It does have a unique set of constraints, though. Uh, particularly, there's a very tight schedule. There's a lot of bands on the bill, so they need to make sure they get on and off the stage really quickly. So they're trying to evaluate some ways to pare down the amount of equipment that they have on stage so that it takes them less time to get on and off. And one of the things that the band uses a lot of are synthesizers. Multiple members of the band play the synthesizer. Even if you're playing another instrument, you're probably responsible for also playing the synthesizer. Band members need to stretch out across the stage to be able to reach all of the synthesizers they need to play at one time. Uh, here's the drummer not playing the drums but instead playing the synthesizer. So these instruments are just littered across the stage and they're trying to figure out, can we get away with not having so many of them for this one particular show? And as the name implies, the way that a synthesizer works is that it synthesizes different sounds and you can store those sounds in things called patches. Those basically act as presets that you can then recall later quickly. So this is a saved representation of the, the knobs you might twist and the dials you might spin and the buttons you might press to make the synthesizer sound exactly the way you want it to. And having those patches being able to recall really quickly is very important because when you play a note on the synthesizer, you want to make sure that you have the right patch set before playing the note. Because if you have the wrong patch set, while musically you are playing the correct note, it's not going to sound like the song at all if you're using the wrong patch. Now, each synthesizer implements the way that they store these patches differently. And so let's just look at one example manufacturer. And when you want to read the patch memory that they have these patches stored on, they just use a case statement. This synthesizer has four buttons that you can use for presets, so not a lot. But when you press each of those buttons, it accesses different positions in memory. What the band wants to know is which of the patches they're even using for this one show. The thought being, if we can figure out which patches we're using and not using, maybe we can consolidate something, but we got to check the results. And so we're going to take advantage of the fact that the band has to practice this set because, as we mentioned, they're playing a shorter show, so they're cutting certain songs out and they want to make sure the transitions sound right. So when they practice that show, we're going to set up the stage just like we do normally where each synthesizer is going to have all of the patches that we use and we'll have the band practice the show. As you might imagine, we're going to do so using coverage. Here we're going to explicitly ask coverage to start in one shot lines mode. The band will play the set list and we'll see what we get back. What comes back looks really similar to lines coverage, but let's once again dig into the details here. We get back a hash, the keys of which are again the names of files that are executed while coverage is running. The value of which is a, another hash, where the key is the mode of coverage being run. And then we get another array for the value. Now in lines coverage, this array was telling us how many times each line was executed. And this order was important, so index 0 was line 1. Order doesn't matter in one shot lines. One shot just tells you if a line was executed or not. It doesn't tell you how many times. So this array is telling us that lines one, two, and three were all executed in this file. And in fact, if we want to find out every line, we get this big old array, and these are just these are line numbers. And so if we go back to our implementation of reading memory addresses, we had this case statement. And we want to know if we accessed and used these different patches at all. So if we keep track of these line numbers, we can take the output from coverage and just ask if those line numbers are in that array that comes back. As a result, 
we find out that we're using three of the four patches on the synthesizer. And that's either good news or bad news. It's not a great candidate for consolidation, but hey, we're using it a lot, so we probably need it. But if we perform this exercise on every synthesizer on stage, we might find one that we're only using one of these patches for. And as long as we don't need to use both of those instruments simultaneously, maybe we can get away for this one show of moving the patch onto that other synthesizer, and then we don't need to load that uh, synth onto stage at all. Now, I recognize that if you're a synthesizer person, you might be screaming that two of the same patches will sound radically different on different synthesizers, and that's the majesty and beauty of these instruments, and I'm with you. <laughs> But the band is just looking for a reasonable facsimile for this one show. And thanks to one shot coverage being able to tell us which lines we accessed or not, we were then able to consolidate the amount of equipment we needed, get everything on stage that we didn't, none of the things that we don't, have the band play the festival set list, and have it still sound the way that we expect it to. One shot was helpful here because it didn't matter if we use a patch once or a million times, we still need to make sure we have access to it during the show. We're now on to the second half of our set. We're going to talk about methods coverage, and we're going to be helping out the lighting team. Lighting team has a bit of a problem. They have a spotlight right on the lead singer. And for the last couple of songs, that sh or shows, that's just been going out when it shouldn't be. That'd be a problem for any light, but it's particularly problematic when it's front and center on your stage. And let's just say that the lead singer is a bit of a perfectionist, so it's in their best interest to make sure that they figure out what this problem is pretty quickly. Now, if you thought that the band played with a lot of synthesizers, just wait till you see their light show. Like they're well known for the lighting rigs they bring on tour with them, and they contract out with special effects firms and lighting teams to design lights that didn't even exist before just for their concerts, which is a lot to say they have a lot of lights. <laughs> so many so that they can't even keep track of which they're using, right? They might be using a light for only one or two songs. And as the tour has gone on and they're playing different songs and moving things in and out of the set list, there might be lights that they're not even using, but they don't know about it. And so one of the theories on the team is maybe these venues just don't have enough power to be able to support all of these lights. And if we could find some way to unplug some of them, maybe we'll have enough power for the lights that we do need. And so let's talk about how lighting works for our concerts. Uh, the lighting team are really another set of performers, just like the band on stage. They just don't get any of the credit. But for every note of every song, they're keeping track of the visual aesthetic of how things should be looking on stage. So for every note, they're turning lights on and turning lights off, and not just turning them on, but making sure they have the right colors and effects, and they're pointed the right way, and everything looks just the way it's supposed to. And now, whether it be a projector, or a can light, or a moving light, or a troublesome spotlight, all of these different classes of lights respond to the trigger method. It's the method you call to turn the light on. And so we're going to perform an experiment on the next show of the tour, where we're going to set everything up just as we do normally, light all the lights, plug everything in, have the band play the show, and then we'll tear everything down and put it back in the trucks and get ready for the next one. But when we do this exercise, we are once again going to use our friend Coverage to help us out. This time we're going to use Methods Coverage because we're interested in knowing uh, how often the particular method is executed, not an individual line. We don't care what happens within the trigger method of the can light or the moving light or the spotlight. We just care that it was called at all. And so we'll have the band play this, this show that we'll perform this experiment in, and we'll see what we get back. And now this looks a little different than what we've seen thus far, but let's do the same exercise we've done before and dig into one element in the hash that we get back. As has been consistent with the other modes, the key of this hash is the name of a file executed under coverage, the value of which is a hash where the key is the mode of coverage 
being reported on. And the value of that hash is another hash where the keys are a bunch of identifying information about the method. And the key is the count of the number of times that that method was executed while coverage was running. But let's zoom in and explode on this innermost hash because I skipped over a bunch of elements and we'll go through one by one. We already talked about the far end, the count, which is the value for the number of times that this method was executed under coverage. But now going left to right, this first identifying piece of information is the name of the class that we're talking about. Remember the outermost hash key is the name of the file, but a file can have zero or more classes in it. So this is helping us figure out which class in that file we're reporting on. The second value is the name of the method. And for our purposes, this is sufficient information. From this, we can find out how often these trigger methods are being called on each of these different lights. But we have these other four numbers in here, so we might as well explain what they are. And they're giving us some information to help orient ourselves within the file. So this first number is the starting line number. The second is the starting column number. And then we have the same thing for the end with the ending line number and the ending column number. So they just help identify where in the file this method exists. And so we're trying to find out if there are any lights that we're not using. And we can see that our projector here, we set up and have ready to go, but we never even use it. So now the next time we roll into a town and light the lights, not so fast projector, we can just keep you unplugged. And instead we'll only have power going to the lights that we are using. And when making that change, hopefully that leaves enough power for the lights that are used throughout the course of the show. Because we were interested in knowing whether an overall method was executed, we used methods coverage to help us with that because we didn't have to care about the details of which line numbers within the methods were called, just that the method itself was called. We're moving on to our closing number here today. And for our last song together, we're actually going to help the band get ready for the last show of the tour. One of their uh, friends is going to be in town, and he's also a singer in a band, and they've invited him on stage to play a song, and they let him pick which one. Uh, and he, he chose one of theirs, but it's not one that they've been playing on this tour. So in the shows leading up to our last show, the band's been using Soundcheck as an opportunity to practice so they don't make complete fools of themselves on stage. And so they know what song they're going to practice. And in the early afternoon, they amble on stage, plug in their instruments, tune up, get everything ready to go, and they play the song. And they're going through this exercise and something just doesn't sound right, but they can't figure out quite what it is. So they're trying to identify any way to analyze what's going on here. And they really don't have anything, but they finally say, like, look, our friend coverage has helped us out a couple of times. Let's see what it can do here. And the issue is they don't even really know what problem they're trying to solve. So they don't, you know, they don't really know what to ask coverage. So they're just like, look, let's just, we'll throw the kitchen sink at it. You can pass the all symbol to coverage.start. And that tells coverage, like, just give me everything you got. Run everything. We'll have the band rehearse the song yet again. We'll see what we get back. And predictably, what we get back is a whole bunch of information. But I want you to take from the slide is not really the values in here, but hopefully some appreciation or understanding for why the data that we get back from coverage is structured this way. In all the prior examples, we've explicitly started coverage with one mode, but you can run multiple modes of coverage at the same time. And that's why within a given file, you have you can have multiple keys representing the different kinds of coverage that were run. And so in fact, if we look for which types of coverage were run on our song here, we see that we have lines coverage, methods coverage, and branches coverage. But we're missing one, right? What happened to one-shot lines? So it turns out there's a technical limitation in how coverage is written such that lines coverage and one-shot lines coverage can't be run simultaneously. 
And lines coverage can tell you the same information that one shot lines does just presented in a different way, right? Using line coverage, you can figure out if a line was executed or not. You just also know how many times it was executed. So when faced with the opportunity to use one or the other, uh, coverage result resolves to using lines coverage. And so we're going to go fishing here and just see if we can find out anything. So we'll start, we'll just go coverage by coverage. And so we want to see if there are any lines in our song that we're, we're not running through and, and we're, we're using all of the relevant ones. So there's really no help there. And it stands to reason that if we're executing every relevant line, then we're calling every method. And that's also true. But we captured the information we had to ask. And that leaves us with branches coverage. And I don't really know what we're looking at here, but we've got a zero. So maybe there's something. So let's one last time dig into the results of coverage and walk through what we get back here. Predictively, the key of this hash is still a name of a file under coverage, the value of which is another hash where the key is the mode of coverage being reported on. The value of each of those entries in that hash is another hash, the keys of which are all of the conditionals within that file. The value of which is another hash, the key of which is all of the branches within that conditional within that file. Let's zoom in on one of these branches and talk about what all of this information is here. Maybe you've guessed correctly that the value here is the count for the number of times that this branch is executed while coverage was run. And congratulations if you did, you are correct. And now going left to right, this first identifier is a, a descriptor for the kind of branch. This is an if conditional with a then and an else, and this is the then part of that conditional. In branches coverage, each conditional and branch gets a unique identifier, and that's what this first number is. And then these next four numbers are the same numbers we get out of methods coverage, with the starting line number, the starting column number, the ending line number, and the ending column number. And this feedback is actually really helpful in this example, because as you can see, the branch starts and ends on the same line. And in fact, the entire conditional is all on the same line. It's a ternary statement. Uh, so we can use those column numbers to help figure out that what uh, coverage is saying is that we never return this 10 back out of this if test. And so now it's on us to figure out if that's even a problem. So let's figure out what this code is even doing. What this is doing is setting up a vocal effect on the lead singer's microphone uh, for how echoey it should sound. And the, uh, the song has a couple of verses and a couple of choruses, and we pass in a number to the chorus method to figure out how echoey it should be. And it should like wax and wane across the different choruses. And the problem is it's just waxing and not waning or vice versa, depending on your perspective. Because the numbers we're passing in here never satisfy both conditions of this if test. So it always goes to the else condition. But it should be going to both parts. And so we found an actual bug in our code. And the issue is we have a, an off by one error or like, you know, these choruses shouldn't be zero indexed, they should be one indexed. And so when we change the number that we pass in to this chorus method and we run coverage again, we can see that we execute both branches of this conditional. As a result of that, the song sounds the way it should and the band can go up on stage for the last show of the tour, invite their friend up, and things sound the way it should, and the audience is none the wiser that they had all this hard time figuring out what was going on. And it was thanks to branches coverage that they were able to identify that uh, because lines coverage was telling us, hey, you're, you're good, you're executing every line of this file. And that was correct. Uh, the issue is there was a code, there were multiple code paths on one single line and only branches coverage was able to tell us, hey, you're not executing part of this line. And then ultimately it was on us to figure out, does that matter? So let's take a break here before we get up on stage and wrap up. We've been talking about Ruby's coverage module and Ruby's coverage module has four different modes that can help you answer four different questions about your code. 
If you want to know how many times each line was executed, you can use lines coverage. If you don't care about how many times something was executed, but just that it was executed, you can use one shot lines. If you only care about how many time, or sorry, if a line was executed, uh, one shot lines uh, will provide a performance benefit over lines coverage because for the second through nth time that a line is run, it doesn't have to do that bookkeeping to keep track of it. If you don't care about individual lines, but you want to know if and how often methods are called, you can use the aptly named methods mode. And if you want to dig into your conditionals and find out how often your branches are being executed, you can use branches mode. Now, if you're interested in using coverage in your application, but you want a little help, there are a couple of gems I can recommend. If you want to use coverage to evaluate your test coverage, I recommend SimpleCov. But if you want to ask some uh, questions about your production code, you can use the CoverBand gem. Both of them use Ruby's coverage module under the hood. If you would like to have a bit of a narrative description of coverage as has been presented in this talk, you can visit this github.io page. Uh, a link will also be present in the chat and I will add one in the Slack channel after we get done here. On that page, you can also find a link to the, a copy to these slides, a link to a repository that has all of the code examples, and uh, you can learn a little more about the NAR company if you're interested. I'm also on Twitter at Kevin underscore J underscore M. I'm happy to connect with you there and talk about any, any questions you might have. But directly after this, I'm also going to be jumping in the Slack channel for this talk, which is RC Talk, enough coverage to beat the band. And I'll answer any questions there. So we can talk about you know what concerts you've seen, what concert you had tickets to this year and couldn't get to, or you know we can talk about coverage, whatever you might want. So. I thank you all for being here. You've been a great audience. I thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Much appreciated. Like Kevin said, jump on over to the Slack channel, answer some questions if you have any, give some mass kudos, join them on stage virtually speaking, at least, you know, all the things. Uh, fantastic. So thank you so much, Kevin. Much appreciated. Really great talk. Really enjoyed it. I always love the analogy or, or the comparison to other areas in the industry and the world. I come from a performing arts background. So, you know, it was very, I felt you, I felt this. I, I felt you here. I did. I, I was there all the way. All right, everyone else, let's jump on over to Slack, finish up things there, ask questions over there. But I will say to you before you go, we are still looking for a handful of folks to join us, maybe even Kevin. I have a feeling Kevin is a performer, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, uh, if you have the opportunity or want to participate in uh, telling a story of your experiences or whatnot, don't forget, we're still looking for some submissions. But otherwise, See you over there.